Welcome to the Monday Bulwark podcast. So uh, Mondays are always hard because you have all the craziness over the weekend. You have the super spreader events and more on the way. And the amazing story about the Superman t-shirt, which I'm going to have to spend some time on. Uh, Donald Trump gets the coveted Taliban endorsement. There's still part of me. It was is is it is it boring now to say? Can you imagine what Republicans would have done if Barack Obama was endorsed by the Taliban the month before the election? Uh, of course, uh, today we have the Supreme Court confirmation hearings as the Republicans unleash their by any means necessary plan to get Amy Coney Barrett on the court. And apparently, confirmed a week before the election, there are devastating new polls for Trump world that would suggest that late-breaking undecided voters are going to Biden, the reverse of what happened four years ago. And then, of course, you have the president getting in a Twitter fight with Anthony Fauci. I don't know if this is the end of the Faucian bargain or not, but in terms of closing arguments. Uh, speaking of closing arguments, we're joined by Tom Nichols, one of our good friends, longtime podcast guest, and our resident Eeyore on, on all things political. So uh, good morning, Professor. <laughs> Good morning, Charlie. Well, it's a gray, it's a gray, cloudy day here today. Yeah, but well, before we even started this, you said, "Where do we even start?" And that—that's kind of the problem here because there's so many things going on. Just when you think that, hey, this is the most interesting thing that's uh, that, that's happening, you have the president tweeting out this morning, and I, I know you've heard this before, all you folks, that the president is on a crazy <laughs> Twitter rant. But we are three weeks away from the election. And he is tweeting things like, New York is going to hell. Vote for me. California has gone to hell. It's like, OK, Tom, how do you put it in context when the president of the United States is writing about the two most populous states in the country of which he is president? <laughs> the, the first thing that occurred to me when he got out of the hospital and started his, you know, uh, Dexie's midnight tweeting um uh tweets was how used to it we've become that yeah. the president of the United States is completely nuts and that any like every day there are five things that happen that at this point would either be the complete end of an administration an instant impeachment or and I I never used to walk side by side with any of this talk but I have to say or a 25th amendment yeah. problem and and instead we you know, like, again, like crazy grandpa ranting at the tape, we just go, well, you know, it's how he is. Um, you know, he says stuff and, and it's easy to just kind of shrug because we live in a very unserious time. We, we forget how serious politics is. We forget how serious the job of president is. And so we have this guy who's the commander in chief who has the nuclear codes you know, who is located at the nerve center of American government saying completely whacked out stuff 24 seven. And we all kind of shrug and go, well, what are you going to do? Well, well we, 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 we shrug and we go, but Joe Biden won't answer this question on court packing. Look, I want to get to that a little bit later. But as I said to Bill Crystal on Friday, this has got a real butter emails vibe to it, because if we're really indignant about things that, the you know, that a candidate for president is not answering, it's kind of a long list of questions that Trump hasn't answered, not to mention the the daily, uh, you know, suggestion that his political opponent should be indicted and thrown in jail, which, as you point out, we've gotten so numbed. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. OK, yeah. so can we, can we talk about the T-shirt? <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to trivialize it, but I mean, this is this is where we're at here. New York Times over the weekend uh, had this amazing deep dive into the swampiness of of Donald Trump. I think really making the case that he's probably not probably that he is undoubtedly going to be remembered as the single most corrupt president in U.S. history. But what everybody's actually talking about is this story that that in several phone calls last weekend from the presidential suite, Trump shared an idea he was considering when he left the hospital. He wanted to appear frail at first when people saw him. But underneath his button down dress shirt, he would wear a Superman T-shirt, which he would reveal as a symbol of strength. When he ripped open the top layer, he ultimately did not go ahead with the stunt. Tom Nichols, we have a 12 year old boy as president of the United States with the emotional maturity of what maybe maybe a nine year old. Twelve, I was going to uh, say. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize and, to 12 year olds. And, and let me just say, 
in, you know, just as there are Beatles versus Elvis people, there are Superman versus Batman people. I have always been a Superman guy. Oh and, yeah. You know, uh, Batman I, you know, just has stuff. Yeah. Well, but, and, and also Batman's a psycho, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I, Truth, Justice, The American Way, you know, Christopher Reeve is part of my uh, adolescence. And, and the idea of Donald Trump wearing this beloved icon of American culture is both laughable and crazy at the same time. And once again, we're all kind of shrugging of saying, well, what are you going to do? You know, as long as the guy with the nuclear football isn't in on it, everything's OK. Um, and and I think, it, again, it shows you this kind of weirdness and double standard where Obama took pictures of himself with a selfie stick and goofed around in the Oval. And you and I and a lot of other conservatives went nuts about it. You know, people are always yelling at us. You guys got to own what you did in the past. OK, I'll own it. I want the presidency to have a lot of decorum. I want presidents to be stodgy and dull and, you know, or. At the very least, if they're going to be glamorous to do it with that kind of ne the Ronald Reagan approach of never take your jacket off in the oval kind of thing, you know, but th this I just went dull. Th this is nuts. Yeah. And OK, so, you know, mentioning the Superman thing, you know what occurs to me on all of this? OK, so it, it is the, you know, nine, nine year old boy men mentality. But but it, if he would have done it and, you know, he's going to do it at some point. You know, he's once good. he gets it, he's going to right. do it at some point. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to ruin Superman. Superman. It's exactly. like you have everything you touch turns to Mared and you've appropriated one thing after another. And please just do not let him he ruined. He ruined up Superman. Red, well, he ruined red ties. Um, You know, like, I, I'm not I'm not giving up the red tie. No, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, I, I, I was actually in a men's store and I made this joke and the guy behind the counter, this is a place in DC. And he said, Oh no, we're not selling. He's like, we're, we definitely have not been selling, you know, red ties, uh, as much. And it, it just was kind of made me laugh because the few times I've pulled out a red tie, my wife just kind of shakes and shakes her head. She's like, no, can't do it. Can't okay, do it. Okay. Okay. You know, you know what? Tom, you're going to take me down the rabbit hole now, and or at least I'm going to go down the rabbit hole now, because you know that if he does the Superman thing, we're going to get the whole narrative. You know, the Superman was always a fascist symbol, right? Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't he the Ubermensch? Isn't this like Nietzsche? Isn't well, that isn't the first time? Created, and so, except yeah. he was created by two Jewish guys, um, you know. So I, I'm not, you know. Of course, facts don't really matter in a debate like that. But I think, you know, the. <laughs> The people that have said he's not Superman, he's Zod. No, even Zod was brave and, and a general. I mean, they're always comparing Trump. He's not Zod. People on the left are always comparing Trump to these, you know, fascists uh, like Hitler or Mussolini. And it's important to remember these were evil men who nonetheless had a lot of physical bravery and and a certain amount of, I mean, you know, oh. they they were in the okay. military. It's well, this, just, this notion, this notion that Trump is one of these brave, you know, fascist warriors, he's just a little boy on a tear inside the White House wanting to wear his Superman jammies for Halloween too early. Yeah, little Lord Fauntleroy. I mean, let's let's not. But there is this this idea of Trump out there. I've actually been kind of thinking about writing something about this that because I've been reading a lot of stuff from Trump world and, you know, talking to people. And and what's very clear is that. That what they support is this sort of fake, pornified idea of Trump, not the real guy. So in their mind, he is strong. He's superhuman. He's got, you know, a six pack. He is, you, you know, sexually potent as opposed to, you know, the, the pudgy reality. But but the idea of Donald Trump and I guess the part of the problem is it's so disconnected from the reality that even when he is defeated, that idea is still going to be out there of kind of the, you know, the the super nationalist identitarian Ubermensch. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to screw up super. Yeah. Right I mean, here. I, there's a, there's a part of me that um, thinks that like all cults of personality, they don't do well once the personality uh, has been, you know, vanquished from, from the leadership. I mean, I, I agree with you that, you know, when you read the comments from people like Seb Gorka or, or Kurt Schlichter, there's almost this kind of weird eroticism about the way they talk about Trump's manliness that 
you know, there's a lot of projection. There's a lot of insecurity. I mean, there is a lot psychological. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. Um, You know, but I I think, um, you know, part of this on a more serious note, it, it shows what a lie all of the arguments about this supposedly populist movement really are that it, you know, for two years and it, and it's interesting because I, I had a conversation with somebody about a new book by Michael Sandel, the, the philosopher, and, you know, he's still taking the, well, it's the people left behind and it's disrespect and it's a lack of dignity. And I think, you know, that, that argument played out better two or three years ago. I think as we head into this election after four years of this, it's really clear that none of that stuff really mattered, that this is just a kind of a, a nasty streak, particularly among middle-aged white men who are kind of having this gigantic midlife crisis. That's what the Superman thing really said to me and, and how many people buy into the whole Rambo image is that this this is like a gigantic midlife crisis of middle-aged white men. And I say that as, you know, a middle-aged a, a, a white male in late middle age, but it feels like a lot of our uh, brothers um, out there, Charlie, are basically having a nervous breakdown. And that's why they feel the need to think that they're on the same team as this guy who's, you know, with totally ripped abs, who's walking around carrying a 50 caliber, uh, you know, and looking at the Vietnamese and saying, this time we get to win, right? Yeah, with the American flag bandana. No, yeah. I, hey, so just riffing off the the, the nervous breakdown I, I i had a tweet over the weekend that i kind of thought that the twitter verse felt like it was bored it's that d- terrible combination of being kind of bored but still highly stressed out which is why we're having all these slappy fights that people are picking slappy fights over absolutely nothing that there is that kind of a moment okay i don't i don't want to go down that rabbit hole so um i know that you're the eor and you've been really really concerned about this election but it strikes me that the the, the the news development to watch today, we, we've already talked about uh, you know, what's happening with women voters, uh, senior citizens, all of those storylines. But the the one that I've been waiting for is the whole question of where did the undecideds break? And famously, 2016, undecided voters, for whatever reason, broke heavily for Trump against Hillary Clinton at last time, which is why everybody was shocked. It's now looking like the opposite is happening. So you you have the Washington Post survey, ABC Washington Post survey. You have their story showing that among voters who backed a third party candidate in 2016, about half of them are supporting Biden. Only about 26 percent say they intend to choose uh, Trump. Um, I don't know whether you saw Tim Miller's piece yesterday. They did uh, our back, did. Uh, Republican voters against Trump actually at. We're talking to undecided voters. I can't imagine why anybody would be undecided at this point, but there, there apparently are these folks. And they asked them an open-ended question. Just, just you, you riff on it. What? Why do you not support Trump? Why are you undecided? Two thirds of them said he's a racist, arrogant, unintelligent jerk who doesn't represent the country well. Lies is unfit to uh, unfit to do the job. And some of the verbatims: he's a horrible human being. He's incredibly rude. Terrible representative of our country. He's sexist and racist. He's an idiot. His arrogance, slime bag. And those are the undecided voters. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, two, two things. Um, you know, first of all, I uh, before we don't go down that rabbit hole, I, I, I think I know the slap fight you're referring to. And I think one of the things we're seeing in both on social media and in real life is that Trump has exhausted us all. Yeah, he has yeah. enervated us all to the point where we're all a little cranky. And, you know, we, people that are normally friendly with each other are, you know, it's the narcissism of small differences now. Well, I parted my hair on the left. Well, you parted your hair on the right. And, you know, then we fight about that because um, we are simply overwhelmed and our nerves and our ability to take in more bad information are fried. And I think underneath that, at least I think for a lot of us who identify as conservatives, there's also a tremendous amount of humiliation at where our country ha- has become, you know, the, the, the American exceptionalism that is a part of conservatism, uh, really t- has taken a beating. I, I, I used to take pride in kind of lecturing my Russian friends about the durability of constitutional democracy. And I, I have to admit, if I were in Moscow now, I might, you know, I might put a lid on some of those lectures. You um, know, it's, I, I agree with you, by the way, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. The second part, 
is about undis you know i am notorious for my um um impatience with undecided voters because you know this is uh even though david sedaris wrote it about the 2008 election um because he felt that way about mccain and obama this really is the election where you know it's a it's a uh, you have your choice. You're on an airplane and it's a choice between the chicken and a giant plate of feces with broken glass in it. And you yeah. pause and say, but how is the chicken cooked? Yeah. And uh, I I think with the undecideds this time around, just like in, in some way, just like the last time, what undecided voters to me, and I am not a voting behavior expert. I'm, I'm a run of the mill political scientist. I think a lot of undecided voters look for cues in society that give them a permission structure to go in the way they were going to go anyway. Right. Um, looking and, for that pretext. Well, and, 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 you know, I mean, in some cases, I think pretext is more like our friends in the conservative media, Charlie, who know what they're doing. But I think a lot of average voters say, look, I really want to lean this way. And my gut tells me that, but it would be nice if I had some kind of larger cues in the environment about why it's okay to think the way I already think. And I think in 2016, for example, you had a really forceful, and the media did not help this, by the way, you had a really forceful movement of third party candidates that everybody knew about, and the media loved them. And Gary Johnson was on all over the place. And Jill Stein hadn't yet, you know, completely cratered as the pro-Russian anti-vax nutcase uh, that she eventually, you know, turned out to be, even if some of us knew it, it took a while for for the rest of the country to catch up and because people just didn't like Hillary Clinton and they wanted to go somewhere. 2020 is different. And this is where I have to, you know, before the show, you were asking me if my Eeyore, you know, if I was doing my Eeyore moan, you know, and, and the numbers, if I'm being a perfectly rational person, the numbers tell me that I can't be that depressed. Um, what always worries me, of course, is, Demo is are the Democrats and Democratic turnout, which I think is going to be okay this time around. But also, there isn't a high profile. Th like, I, I don't even know who the Libertarian candidate is, and that's good. Um, Jill Stein is a spent force. Um, I think, you know, Hillary Clinton is not there to give people the backstop of saying, well, you know, I don't know about Trump, but I, you know, I just can't. People like Joe Biden, even when they disagree with him, you know, you just people just don't hate the guy. And I think that makes a huge difference. And I, I think the undecided voters and I think Trump has given those undecided voters that last permission structure of saying, hey, if you had any doubts about me, I'll come on TV every day and be a completely odious human being that will alienate you every five minutes in case well, you forget. Well, people forget in 2016 that one of the things that the Trump world figured that they figured out temporarily was that the lower profile Trump was, the better he did. And so he actually right. was on his best behavior in the final weeks of the campaign. There is literally no evidence that he's going to be on the best behavior over the next three weeks. In fact, uh, as you just mentioned, he wants to be out there every single day. He wants to be on television every single day for the next three weeks. And so Joe Biden, I mean, this guy's been extremely fortunate. Uh, because um, he's kind of realized that, hey, um, I'm just not going to interrupt too much while this guy is is imploding. You know, right. just taking this to like the 50,000 foot level about sometimes you look back on a campaign and an election and you, you the 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 theme is obvious what was going to happen. So in in, for example, in, in 2008, it was obvious that that people were sick of George W. Bush. There was a financial crisis. And of course, they were going to take a chance on fundamental change. 2012, it was I'm sorry, 2016 was so obviously um, a change election. You know, both the Democrats and the Republicans were clearly not prepared to go with the dynasties. Uh, you know, Jeb Bush had no shot whatsoever. Um it was the perfect moment for a chaos candidate. Everything lined up for for Donald Trump. The Democrats made a massive mistake by saying in a year in which it was overwhelmingly about change to come up with a status quo candidate like Hillary Clinton. Now, we'll never know. But if Joe Biden had been running in 2016, he might have been that status quo candidate. He was also that would have been perhaps the wrong year for him. This is the perfect year for Joe Biden, where the man and the moment match up 
people want normalcy. They want decency. They want a guy with empathy. And then, then because of the pandemic, he's also basically had an excuse to kind of keep a low profile. And 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 not and not have to totally like burn himself out, you know, in a, in a gaftastic ninety day run. So I mean, things are kind of lining up for, you know, a, a guy like Joe Biden who might not have been that great a candidate in any other year. I, I think um, you know we can we can play the counterfactual history game. I think Joe Biden probably would have won in twenty sixteen simply because Trump's margin was so small, yeah. and that margin seemed to be driven. Um, very heavily by the the existence of Hillary Clinton and the kind of campaign she won. But then he would have been um, soundly defeated in 2020 because, as you say, it would have, you know, uh, it was a change election. But um, I'm going to, before I go too deeply into that, I'm going to take a giant I told you so here. Because for months, years, um, people on the left and particularly, you know, liberal Twitter and people on the left and in the media we're like, stop giving Trump a free platform. Stop letting him just go on TV. Stop, you know, broadcasting the rallies. And I, I said, let him talk. Let him put him on TV every damn day. Give him the, the four to six slot on Fox. Do whatever it takes. Because now we're seeing that in, in one, there was an NBC um analysis a couple of days ago that one of the groups that was the most alienated by those daily briefings were seniors and seniors yeah. unlike young people on liberal twitter seniors vote and they vote big and the fact that trump has lost huge amounts of turf with american seniors is one reason why you know as much as i want to be you know in, indulge my 2016 ptsd um I, I think, yeah. uh, you know, there's a real chance there. So put him on TV all the time. The other thing, Charlie, you, you pointed out he was on his best behavior. He was also on reasonably good behavior for the debates in 2016. Now, he was a jerk and he stalked Hillary around the stage. And, you know, he did the new puppet. You're the puppet. Wrong. There, was a lot of, there, was, there was a lot of sniffing, too. So there was a lot of sniffling. But this time. He really came out and said, okay, I am your president. I am the commander in chief. I am here to debate Joe Biden. And by the way, I am a complete raving lunatic. Uh, and that, you know, that was really important. I think it's, I, I am personally, I am pissed that he has weaseled out of the town hall format because I think the cherry on this Sunday would have been to put him in a town hall format debate and let him start interrupting and insulting ordinary voters like he did he would have his Stephanopoulos thing where he was already lighting himself on fire. And I think his staff was like, find so any. I mean, you know, if I were his staff, I would have been licking doorknobs to give him covid to get him out of this, um, you know, because his only chance is to just, uh, you know, put him in a bag and keep him under wraps. And he's just not going to do that. So I. I you know, with three weeks left to go, I, I, I'm I literally knocking on the bamboo of my desk here and saying that unless something really dramatic happens, I think this election is mostly safe. Yeah, I, I think so. So let me go back to the, the Trump on TV, because, you know, you're clearly right about the, you know, putting him up uh, every single day was a good thing for people to see him. But, you know, I, I think it's and I'm going to steal the, the line from Josh Kraschauer. It's because it's the fat Elvis thing. It's like the guy maybe was a rock star four years ago and it was fresh and it was exciting. But four years later, it's like we've seen this show and it's it's just disgusting. So it, that's it, why it, we it, didn't put fat Elvis on the stamp. Yeah, that's why it, when we wanted to remember Elvis, you know, we put a uh, post army, uh, you know, fit as whipcord Elvis on the stamp. And I think putting him out there every day. You know, the, you you and I were talking just a second ago about the ripped Rambo, the tough, you know, and instead what you get is this petulant, sniffly little boy whining. You notice the response of most Trumpers, by the way, when you ask them what they think of that, they say, oh, I don't watch that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't I don't, see that. Yeah. I didn't see that. I don't I don't want that's that's just fake. I don't want or or older Trumpers. And I hear this a lot from from people whose parents are are Fox zombies. They say. I know what he meant. I know what he meant. Uh, and I think putting him out there 
every day was kind of like just water wearing away the stone over and over again, because you can't put him out there for two hours a day and then have anybody but the most pathetic hypnotized Trumper say anything but, oh my God, that was terrible. There's yeah, only so it, many times you can say I didn't see it because it was on Trump every, uh, excuse me, on Fox every single day. And, and he's going on Rush Limbaugh. He's going back to Maria Bartiromo, which basically strikes me. As, as, it, exactly. It, it, it's almost like the, the campaign's going into hospice care. It's like they just want to keep him comfortable and happy. Now, by the way, I, I, I shouldn't have said that line because I used it in 2016 and that didn't play out well for me at all. Um, but it does feel that way. It's, it's like, it's like you, it's you are, you're right. You, you're going back to the very small audiences compared to, say, a national debate. But you know that it's a comfortable audience and where he can indulge his absolute craziness. I know that uh, Jim has a, a soundbite. There are so many. I mean, you could just play well, the whole Maria Bartiromo. But, but this is the yeah. way he ended this debate. He, you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether she ran out of time or she realized that it's just getting too nutsoid, but this is the end of his discussion yesterday morning, uh, the FBI quote. Yeah. And the FBI, look, the greatest people in the world are in the FBI, but the top people were scum, absolute scum. Okay. And they did a horrible job Mr. for our country. Mr. <laughs> President, we so appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. President Donald wow. J. Trump. It's getting it's getting crazy. So I'm going to hit the wow. music there. There's scum. OK, we're in that phase of this particular discussion where he's going to say yeah, we the same thing. And Lindo I know that, like, oh, I know you're busy. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know you got to go, Mr. President. We, we have to indict Joe Biden. We have to indict, you know, Barack Obama. And everybody's going, yeah, this is fine. This is normal. Can we talk about the Supreme Court? Because we are so concerned about a strict construction of the Constitution while you're supporting this guy who is, you know, basically or, you know, ordering the department or, or, or suggesting the Department of Justice uh, should actually go after his political opponents because you are so committed to the rule of law and to constitutional norms. All right. So you want to talk about the Supreme Court stuff? Because Let's do he, it. OK, so the uh, this is the the. the so over the weekend, either Twitter and the media decided that they were going to become obsessed over Joe Biden's um, bad handling of the question of does he support court packing? And I describe his response as suboptimal, although you understand the politics here. I mean, if he endorses the court packing, it overshadows every other issue. So it's a flip flop. And it sets the stage for something that would be a complete distraction in his administration. But if he says he's against it, He's going to demoralize and piss off some of his, you know, his his base and and he's going to surrender what little negotiation, negotiating, um, you know, at leverage he has to discourage bad behavior by Republicans in the Supreme Court. So and if he continues dodging, he's going to tick off the media, Twitter, and he'll look uh, weaselly. So what, what what's what's your take on it? Well, OK, so there's two issues here. One is uh, Biden's increasingly. Um, cranky answer to this question because voters no don't have many, a right now. They don't yeah, have a right now. And I think, you know, when he said, now I'm going to do the old Trumper thing and say, I know what he meant. Um, when they, when the reporter said, you know, don't they deserve to know? And he's, oh, they don't deserve. I think what Biden really meant was you don't deserve to know. Yeah. Uh, but you know, he's been asked that question enough times. And I, I think his, he, the most honest thing he said was yesterday when he said, um, if I answer this question, that's all anyone is going to talk about for the that's next right. three weeks. And I'm not going to do it. And I thought, you know, I kind of admired the Biden campaign for, for that kind of message discipline of saying, I understand why you're asking me this question. I under I called it on Twitter. I referred to it as the Kobayashi Maru question, the, the infamous Star Trek test that has no right answer. Um, all the answers are bad. And you know, so I, I mean, could Biden have, you know, you in your newsletter, Charlie, you yeah. provided a perfectly good template of saying, look, I can't control what the let I'm going to be president, can't control what Congress does. You're asking me a hypothetical. We have to see what the Republicans do. It still wouldn't have diffused any yeah. of the you must say yes or no insistence. But I think the bigger issue here is the titanic hypocrisy of our former conservative brothers in arms over this sudden worry about norms. I and mean, when you get the guys at National Review, you know, suddenly all all being forklempt about norms, you know, oh, but 
this is a really important judicial norm. And if Biden doesn't answer this, how could we possibly know whether the Constitution will be safe under his stewardship while, while Donald Trump is having these meltdowns where he's demanding that the FBI act like the, you know, the Belarusian mili- uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and run around and start arresting his opponents. Uh, so this, you know, this this is the thing I think that a we're little bit of asymmetry concentrating yeah. on Biden. Well, yeah, that's that's right. I mean, and it, it it does feel that this is one of those moments where you know punditry you know hates a vacuum, so we have to have something to, to talk about here. And as I said, I mean, Biden I think could handle this a lot better. I think the crankiness is not helping him. Um, but uh, this is at a moment where you know Donald Trump is not answering some pretty fundamental questions. At the, you know, so I mean, if 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 that's the standard that it's disqualifying, if you don't say what you can do after the election, then how about asking Donald Trump? Are you going to fire the FBI director? Are you going to order Again. the DOJ to indict political opponents? Uh, who do you owe that four hundred million dollars to? Are you going to withdraw it, from it NATO? How, it shows you how successful Trump and his enablers have become at lowering the expectations of the sitting president of the United States to below zero, to subterranean yeah. level. Say so Joe Biden has to answer a completely hypothetical question about a thing, let's face it, Charlie, about a thing that is almost certain not to happen. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, it would be, I, I don't even know how I would feel about it. I mean, there's a part of me that says, you know, we have to change the structure of representation. We can't have you know, 70% of the public being represented by 30% of the seats. I'm open to all kinds of solutions about that. But this court, the idea that Joe Biden's going to walk in and, you know, in February 2021, we're going to have, you know, 14 Supreme Court justices. That's just not going to happen. But it's it shows you how completely corroded and denatured the entire discussion has become that we expect, I mean, in a way, it's a compliment to Biden. We expect right. Biden to answer real questions right. like because a normal human like, being. Exactly. Whereas like Trump is held to a completely different standard. Where, You're where right. As, it, long as, right. as long as Trump doesn't soil himself on stage or burst into, um, you know, F-bombs, which he, you know, now is doing on Limbaugh's show, um, we say, well, OK, you know, he managed to drink a glass of water without hurting himself and he didn't launch any nuclear weapons in the last 90 minutes. So I guess he's OK. And that. That's what I find so infuriating about the unbelievable double standard of, again, the guys at National Review, the anti-anti-Trumpers, you know, the usual suspects who are, are all have, you know, these deep conniptions over norms and standards and traditions. And then Donald Trump wades in with a flamethrower to the National Archive and starts burning all the documents. And they say, well, but but, you know, Joe Biden still hasn't answered one thing. And, yeah, and it's, 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 it's basically the, but, but how is it, but how is the chicken cooked? I mean, that, how, that, that, how is the chicken? I mean, you would think that they would be pounding, that people would be pounding away on, on, on Trump right now saying, uh, are you going to issue after the election? Are you going to issue pardons? Are you going to you know pardon Paul Manafort? What about members of your family? Would you rule out a self pardon? Nobody's even going to bother asking the question because you figure he's not going to tell the truth anyway. Right. He's uh, going to lie. He is, he is going to, to lie. So, this Amy Coney Barrett thing, it, it is um, it's you know, there's certain odd things about our politics because this ought to be I mean, I mean it's going to be a huge deal. There's no question about it. But when you if, if I would have told you that in in 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would die and the Republicans would replace it with with Amy Coney Barrett, you would have said this is going to be the mother of all culture war battles and it's going to be intense. But it kind of feels like a sideshow at the moment. Well, and, and it's, it moment. shows you again, by the way, how Trump, how how the Trump, especially the Trump of 2020, is so nuts that he steps all over his own messages, even when those messages work for him, that he has become, a, a, you know, a completely unmanageable. Um, do you remember? Um, do you remember a movie called The Last Starfighter? Oh yeah, I do actually, Trump, but that changed me. Trump is the death blossom of nuttiness that, you know, he just starts spinning in all directions and he destroys everything around him, well, even when that works for him. I mean, the Amy Coney Barrett thing, if he had had the discipline to shut the hell up and simply say, I'm a Republican president, I'm going to put forward it, you know, 
that would have disarmed a lot of the the um, arguments against her and around her. But in, but of course, as you and I are saying, Amy Coney Barrett, she was nominated what like twelve months ago. Well, that was like four years ago. I mean, the, the, I had to, I was looking at a, at the the Sunday papers. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. They still have to confirm her. Like exactly. It, it, well, it think drops about on it. Your consciousness. Okay, because I always play the Earth 2.0 game. A disciplined President Trump would be talking about three things, maybe right now. Right? He would be talking about the Supreme Court justice. Right? And you know, and, and just discipline, focusing on that, all the issues involving that. He'd be talking about the economy and what he's going to do for the economy. He would have. Uh, before now, worked out a stimulus package so that he could send out checks to people, right? Those three things. And you could probably come up with another, you know, a, a few few others. Instead, he barely seems to bring up the Amy Coney Barrett. He's killed the stimulus um, negotiations. It's, that is not going to happen, despite some of the, you know, dead cat bounce from, from, from last week. And the economy, I... I mean, the guy's all over the place. That's, I mean, by the way, so here's, here's the, here's the money, honey, Maria Bartiromo. And okay. So she's got him on her show yesterday. It's all about the economy. Did you hear this one question she asked him? Mr. President, as we wrap up here, are there UFOs? Well, I'm going to have to check on that. I mean, I've heard that. I heard that two days ago, so I'll check on that. I'll, <laughs> I'll take a good, strong look at that. But uh, I will tell you this, uh, uh, we now have created a military, the likes of which we've never had before ever. in terms of equipment, the, the equipment that we have, the uh, weapons that we have, and hopefully, <laughs> hope to God, we never have to use them. So, I mean, try to imagine you're her, and you're like, okay, well, that's, we have all this economic stuff to talk about, the stimulus package, but I'm talking with Donald Trump, so what the hell are there UFOs? <laughs> Well, and and his answer his answer is right out. You know, we will not go into that night. We will fight for our survival today. We celebrate our Independence Day. You know, our military is the greatest. My, I mean, what? I'm sorry. What are we gonna do? To to paraphrase Will Smith, we're gonna get up there and whoop ET's ass. I mean, what what was that answer about? But it but again, it shows you what a fundamentally unserious country, a fundamentally yeah. unserious people we have become. OK, so uh, inclu including us, because yesterday the New York Times came up with this massive investigative project that will probably win a Pulitzer Prize. And it actually deserves a Pulitzer Prize um, for delving into the swampy corruption of this administration. And no one's talking about this piece. It's so this is so baked in that when they basically will not base when they report that the Trump didn't merely fail to end Washington's insider culture of lobbying and favor seeking, he reinvented it, turning his own hotels and resorts into the Beltway's new back rooms, Republican private business mix and special interests reign. And it's like, yeah, let's 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 move on. I mean, it's it I, I guess we we have so internalized the degree of his corruption that a story that would have dominated any other presidency is almost a an afterthought but again charlie it's telling you something else and this is really important you know one of the running gags that i i do on twitter for four years is you know because this is what the working people of yeah. ohio and indiana yep. wanted right but there is a there is a serious point underneath all of this which is that all that that discussion that Americans are tired of corruption. Americans are tired of the elites. Americans are tired of the inside deals. Uh, Americans are tired of what goes on in the rooms they don't know about. That turns out to be nonsense. Americans have an incredibly high tolerance for corruption. What this really says is what, uh, what, what Americans have become are tribes who only object to corruption when it's not their guy doing it. And that's, I think, says something terrible about moral rot, about the collapse of our civic virtue, the collapse of our commitment to a culture of constitutionalism and the rule of law, that we only seem to object, we, the public, only seems to object when the corruption seems to be falling on people who are out of favor with us at that moment. And so, you know, the, I mean, to me, 2016 was the swampiest election ever, that you were going to have this 
you know, you had these two corrupt New York oligarchic families. Um, you know, this, I mean, that was like a Russian election uh, <laughs> rather than an American election. Um, but now, you know, you have Joe Biden, who has been around for almost 15 years. People know who he, there was a reporter the other day who said something about, well, the debate didn't go well because, you know, there's a lot of people who still don't know a lot about Joe Biden. And I was like, who are these people who don't know about Joe Biden? Um, you know, people know who he is. And what you're really seeing is, again, this this fake populism that says, well, we really wanted the swamp drain. No, they didn't want the swamp drain. They wanted the swamp redirected toward people they happen to like. That's what they wanted. And that tells you something about the state of populism as well. Well, the state of the election right now, we are three weeks out. The president is down by 12 points in the ABC Washington Post poll. Even if the polls are off, as, who was this, Nate Cohn who said this, that even if the polls are off this year as badly as they were in 2016, he still loses. He's behind in a lot of the swing states. The swing states are much closer. So if you want to have a white knuckle polling, look at some of the swing states. But, but you know, the reason I think that he's he's flailing right now, and, and I, I actually think today that he's, that he's going down, like, check back with me in a couple of days, it's because of this coron the coronavirus issue being front and center. This is the one thing he did not want to be talking about. And mm -hmm. the way he's handling it, going out on the road with more super spreader events so that every day, he, basically he wants now, every day between now and the election, to have a picture of him standing in front of you know MAGA audiences that are probably overwhelmingly not wearing masks. And how is, how is that actually going to play? I mean, that, that seems like the worst possible messaging that you could come up with in Trump world. And that's why I hope he does it. And I hope it's televised every day because it is amazing to me the way he handled um, being at Walter Reed and coming out of Walter Reed. Look, people, aside from the cult, aside from, you know, the zombies, um, you know, I've been, while I've been... Um, walking and getting my exercise, I've been listening to World War Z because it just seems appropriate in terms of strategy for dealing with this election. Um, it's, it, he, aside from those people, there are plenty of normals in the world who understand this yeah. is bad. And this is a killed. really bad yeah. thing. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, that is going to cost him support. And f Trump just, I think it, it's a reminder that Trump doesn't care about anything as long as he's getting that narcissistic crack hit yeah. from his base. And, uh, and so on the one hand, I know it would be bad for him to go have these events, but these people, they're going to do this anyway. So you might as well gather them all together. And I, again, I hope Fox televises it every single. Oh, there'll, there'll be, there'll be pictures. I mean, the, the, this, the polls would suggest that the bottom just falling out on the pandemic response and the way that that he's handling it. And so what is he going to do? He's going to double down. I think another indication how bad things are is uh, his obsession with getting out Hillary's emails. I mean, this is like almost this is beyond parody. It's, it's, it's like, getting this, laughable. You know, yeah. it, used, it used to be we'd say, oh, Hillary's emails. And yeah, that was a joke. Examples, yeah. And now it's like, yeah, OK, whatever. Oh, and you're going to. You're going to indict Obama. I mean, Saturday Night Live this weekend did a joke about, you know, you if you woke up from a coma, it's 2016 because Trump is trying to indict Obama and get Hillary's emails. It's the it's the only thing he knows how to do. And it's interesting to see that all of these greatest hits, along with his um, in, his obsession with, you know, the covid uh, rallies. It, as, as you were saying about Barrett, it blows all the other headlines. Now, sometimes it blows the headlines off the page that you wish were there, like his taxes, but it blows all of the news off the front page. This is all about him and COVID and his kind of manic weirdness. Because the one thing Americans don't like, I think, in, in both parties, is they get bored with relitigating previous elections. That's usually never a great thing. It's certainly never a good thing for the incumbent to relitigate the election that actually gave him a victory. Okay, he well, can't help himself. He well, and help he, himself. Can't, he can't help himself. And there's no one around there that can provide the discipline. I mean, there might have been at one point in his administration somebody saying, you should talk about this, don't talk about this, but he can't help himself. So the other story that we're getting is that Senate Republicans are trying to bail on him, they're trying to distance themselves from him. 
Um, hey, a little bit too late. If only they That's, had been warned, huh, Tom? Right. It's Three too, weeks it's in. Too, it's too late for that. Um, and I think the only question now is, you know, when you were talking about the staff around him, I still would like to know when is, you know, when will we finally hear from John Kelly, if ever? When will we hear from Mattis? When will we hear from some of the other people? Because there have been, I mean, it it is tragic that someone as junior as Olivia Troy, who, you know, in, in Washington terms, a very senior person, but it's not a very public person, has to come out. And all the other people who saw all these things are still in the tall grass uh, and, you know, letting others write articles about what they said. But for these Republican electeds, it, it's too late. It's not... You know, Cory Gardner or Joni Ernst or Susan Collins are not going to have a, a Damascene conversion. They're not going to suddenly see the light, you know, two and a half weeks before the election and say, oh, my God, I don't know what I was thinking of quitting Donald Trump. My, you know, gosh, I really wish I had could go back to impeach. No, none of that's going to work. I, don't, I yeah. think, you know, the people's perceptions of those politicians are now, you know, where they are. And it really is going to boil down to. Um, where were you when he was blowing up the stimulus? Where were you while he's holding super spirit rallies? Um, you know, the, the, this sudden uh, idea that, well, we're all, I mean, Mitch McConnell, oh, I haven't been to the White House because I don't agree with how they're handling that. So what? who cares? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the evidence that's being cited for people running away from him is awfully thin on the ground when you yes. put it up against the last four years of sucking up and looking the other way. So they, they made a decision, and they're going to have to live with it. And, you know, what constitutes running away, by the way? Well, exactly. I mean, it, it, there, there's no one is going to stand up and overtly, full-throatedly, criticize the president who's running for election. They're, they're just not going to do it. And so to quote, uh, to quote Maimonides in, in this context, uh, F them, you know, I mean, there's just, I, just, yeah. I, I just, I have, I have, I have no sympathy for them. It's it, again, this is almost beyond parody. You wait till three weeks before the election, everything is falling apart and you go, Hey, by the way, um, did I ever tell you about all the qualms I had about this guy back in 2017 or 2018? So Tom Nichols, thank you so much for spending so much time with us on this special Monday uh, podcast. Uh, we're going to have to mark down the moment when you actually stepped away from the Eorism at least for the moment. Cautiously optimistic, Charlie. Thanks for having me. Mark the tape. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again. There are 22 days to go until election day.